Buon pomeriggio a tutti, grazie di essere venuti a, questa, a questo evento. Faccio una piccola introduzione in italiano, a meno che non ci siano degli studenti che conoscono solo l'inglese, ma penso che possiamo iniziare a fare un saluto in italiano. Eh, è un piacere aprire questa serie di Distinguished Lectures eh, con uh, l'intervento di un amico e collega Arben Mercocci. Eh, fa piacere vedere l'aula piena, ci auguriamo di, di, di aver messo in piedi un programma interessante, importante, ci aspettiamo il vostro feedback, mi raccomando, quindi non abbiate paura a mandare un mail a, alla direzione dando suggerimenti, anche commenti o proposte di nuove distinguisce per il futuro. Comunque per quanto riguarda oggi, oggi abbiamo la prima delle, delle quattro distinguished lecture che sono state selezionate dalla nostra commissione ricerca e la, la distinguished data è presentata da Arben Mercocci, si parla di nanobiosensor design and application in diagnosis e, e lascio la parola a Sandro Pacagnella che ci introduce lo speaker. Grazie di essere venuti. Eh. Bene, buon pomeriggio a tutti, but at this point I will switch to English, so everything will be more understandable to everybody. And let me welcome again uh, all of you, and uh, let me welcome also a very distinguished guest and speaker, who is Professor Armen Bercossi, who is a friend uh, and uh, is a very distinguished researcher at international level, and uh, Uh, we're working with him, we have been working with him for the past couple of years and things are evolving very positively. So uh, we took advantage of a possibility offered by the uh, Distinguished Speaker Series of the, of the department to uh, give strength to our collaboration. And a short bio of Arben, so you start knowing him better and uh, he is a currently professor and director of nanobioelectronics and biosensor group and the Institut Català de Nanociencia y Nanotecnologia, uh, ICN2, which is part of the Barcelona Institute of Science and Technology. Arben got his PhD in 1991 at Tirana University in Albania in the topic of ion selective electrodes. Then he worked as a postdoc and senior researcher or invited professor in the field of nanobiosensors and lightweight chip technologies in several countries in Italy, Spain, USA, and then he moved into uh, uh, ICN2 since 2006. And uh, noticeably, Arben spent a couple of years here in Padova, so he's a uh, very well known by our environment, by our university. In fact, he speaks very well Italian, even though he will, be, he will give his talk in English today. Uh, Professor Mercosi research is focused on the design and application of cutting edge nanotechnology, nanoscience based cost efficient biosensors, and the paper or plastic-based nanobiosensors involve integration of biological molecules such as DNA, antibodies, cells and enzymes, and other receptors, which can be bioreceptors in some instances, with micro and nanostructures and or motors. And uh, they are, these are applied in diagnostics, environmental monitoring and safety and security. He has published around 280 peer review research papers. He has supervised 27 PhD students and has been invited to give plenary lectures and keynote speeches in around 150 plus one today, occasions in various countries, in various institutions. Uh, Arben is editor of the flagship journal uh, in our field, which is biosensors and bioelectronics and their journal is devoted to research, design, development and application of biosensor and bioelectronics. Ben is a member of several of editorial board of several uh, journals. He's involved in teaching PhD courses. He won a, a number of uh, national and international awards 
Uh, he serves as scientific evaluator, member of panels of experts for many different uh, international governmental and non-governmental agencies. And um, remarkably, he is co-founder of two spin-off companies, which can be of some interest to our PhD students and young researchers. One is called Paper Drop, which is dedicated to nano diagnostics, and the other one is named Graphenical Lab to Electronic Printing. At this point, I think that we are ready to listen to a speech which is going to be given by our distinguished guest. Thank you, Arba. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you very much to the department for uh, the invitation. It's a big pleasure for me to be here, always uh, coming in Padova, because uh, it's here where I started also my scientific career. And I'm really very uh, happy that uh, I am uh, starting with this distinguished lecture at my, I consider this my origin university because, uh, uh, and this is why I would like to start with a special thank for my professor. Uh, very happy to uh, have here also Professor Maka. It was like 25 years uh, when I was here. I spent it two years and I was very lucky to work with uh, a big professor of analytical chemistry of this university and in Italy and all over the world. And I learned a lot uh, from uh, all point of views, uh, science, uh, social aspects, and we had very nice uh, uh, cooperation and very nice papers, uh, well seated. Uh, uh, in relation to uh, potentiometric analysis and how one can uh, do calculations uh, uh, for this kind of sensors with a lot of interest. Uh, that time it was a project for uh, weak acids uh, uh, and uh, monitoring of these uh, with interest for environmental uh, aspects and so on. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Mackay, and thanks for coming here. And also my great friend, uh, colleague uh, 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 in the same department, uh, Lydia Solda is also here. We fight a lot uh, uh, to build <laughs> sensors, and today Lydia sent me uh, this nice uh, uh, schematic we try to do together and build this uh, kind of screen printed it was 25 years but and we keep i keep uh, working on that so uh, this was really very very uh, fascinating to receive today thanks uh, lydia so i work at catalan institute of nanoscience and nanotechnology in barcelona uh, this is a joint research center this is why you see here uh, different logos because uh, uh, it is the Spanish government, the general, uh, the regional government, uh, uh, Autonomous University of Barcelona involved in this center, uh, which uh, since uh, three years so we joined together the best uh, research centers in uh, Catalonia. We have created this Barcelona Institute of Science and uh, Technology, uh, BIST, which is uh, a very active institute uh, to put efforts together and uh, have more visibility and so on. Uh, so we are also part of this uh, Barcelona Institute of Science and Technology. And this is when I go far away uh, to explain where we are. So this is uh, uh, Barcelona city and we are uh, somewhere here. So this is the campus of UAB. I put here also different uh, research centers, biomedical research centers, hospitals, because we have a lot of co collaborations with them uh, in the field of biomedical applications, uh, uh, but also we work with other uh, areas. So we are at uh, this uh, campus, which is an uh, international excellence uh, campus uh, with a nice facilities, uh, research park. I should mention that we have a, a synchrotron in the campus, uh, in addition to uh, a business area, technological area, and uh, other innovation uh, services uh, in the campus. Uh, uh, nice facilities also for nano and microfabrication uh, to build devices uh, with nice uh, uh, facilities uh, uh, with uh, the objective as a center to do not only basic research in the field of nanoscience and nanotechnology, but also to bring the, what we are doing in the lab to society. So transference of the technology is uh, very, very important uh, uh, for us. Uh, so in our center, we are doing research in uh, all the areas related to nanoscience and nanotechnology, uh, starting from biosensors for which I am responsible to uh, nanomaterials, nano uh, devices, uh, phenomena at uh, nanoscale, uh, modeling, and so on. So all the, uh, the 
topics related to uh, nanotechnology. And in fact, uh, we have like uh, three important pillars in our center. So our uh, applications overall are related to energy, life science, ICT. So we work together for all these kind of uh, applications. Uh, uh, and in the field of life science for which I work mostly, uh, we try to, to put together also diagnostic therapy and uh, in the so-called uh, Terranostic uh, platforms. Uh, and also uh, in uh, analogy in the environmental area, we are trying to put together uh, the detection of contaminants uh, with uh, destruction strategies. So uh, putting these things together in synergy uh, for, uh, with interest for different uh, industries. Uh, so just uh, focusing now on the health, uh, as uh, most of our applications are related to health, uh, you know that there are a lot of uh, disruptive forces uh, uh, shaping the healthcare nowadays. So aging of population, chronic diseases, spending on health, uh, pandemics, every year there is some uh, uh, new illness. Uh, there is a lot of need uh, to have devices, uh, uh, new diagnostic tools uh, to address these uh, uh, problems, these challenges. Uh, and in fact, uh, the conventional laboratories uh, are working fine, but they have their, uh, their problems. If you want to do something at home, out of the laboratory, we need the so-called uh, uh, point of care uh, devices. And in this context, uh, biosensors are a very good alternative so, uh, to be used uh, uh, out of uh, these uh, laboratories. Uh, so we are talking about very simple devices, simple kits that can be used for uh, diagnostic and other uh, applications. Overall, in places with uh, low resources, extreme conditions, uh, we want these devices and we used to say these are assured. Uh, for you, these devices should be affordable, uh, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, rapid and robust, equipment-free delivered. Otherwise, uh, they cannot address uh, uh, the problems uh, out of the laboratory. And here are just uh, a few examples like uh, simple kits that you can find even in the pharmacy or for example uh, glucose biosensors that uh, it is nowadays in any uh, pharmacy in the, in the world. Uh, so these are some examples of biosensors. Uh, and if we go a little bit deep in, in biosensors and I put here the example of glucose biosensor uh, uh, so that you probably have seen in the pharmacy or you have probably at home used uh, to measure, for example, glucose in blood. But the idea is to have the same kind of devices, but to do a different kind of other applications. And in fact, in biosensors, the most important part is this one. So this disposable part, uh, which contains uh, the receptor and transducer. So the receptor can be either uh, a biological receptor. It can be enzyme, antibodies, uh, uh, DNAs. Uh, and uh, of course, depending on the application, in the case of glucose, uh, uh, you have to use uh, glucose oxidase. Uh, but in the case of uh, some proteins, we want to detect some proteins, you need to use uh, antibodies. Or if you want to detect uh, some genes, you need to use uh, uh, DNA receptors. So once uh, the sample is in contact with this uh, receptor, uh, depending on the interaction, specific interaction, there is a signal produced here. And this signal can be either electrical, optical, mass change, and so on. So the change of this, uh, the production of this signal and the treatment inside this small uh, computer give a signal so one can read the, the result and uh, take care, uh, take, take some measures about, for example, to take insulin or if you need to, to have something else, uh, you can uh, do whatever is necessary. So we are working in nanotechnology and our objective is uh, to improve these devices or to build uh, new devices uh, for different applications. And in fact, uh, we work with different kinds of nanomaterials, uh, starting from micelles, liposomes, uh, uh, metallic nanoparticles, uh, graphene, uh, nanotubes, and more. The nice thing is that this, these materials have uh, interesting physical properties uh, uh, given their size, catalytic properties, optical properties, uh, which uh, uh, given also their size fits quite well with uh, several biomolecules. So it's uh, very uh, normal and uh, logical uh, to work together. So we use these nanomaterials uh, to detect different kinds of uh, biological uh, molecules. Uh, 
And in fact, uh, with the progress and the use of nanotechnologies, uh, uh, a lot of emerging uh, uh, platforms are uh, nowadays uh, uh, in different laboratories, uh, uh, for example, as wearable, smart packaging and control, implanted devices in vivo formats and so on. So there is a lot of research in this field. So biosensors nowadays can be everywhere. Uh, so biosensors can be as medical devices, as wearable. They can be integrated. And there is a lot of effort to integrate uh, uh, biosensor to smartphones. So everybody has a smartphone. So there is a lot of need for this. Everything smart, smart TV, smart fridge, even washing machines, uh, smart houses, uh, food control, environmental control. The uh, smart cities in the future are going to need a lot of sensors and biosensors. So this is just an example from uh, a product launched by Samsung where they try to integrate in the mobile phone in some wearable devices uh, some simple parameters but still there is a lot of need for biological parameters so st still they are just using uh, to measure temperature, heart rate and things like that but not yet uh, any protein or something uh, with interest for biomedical uh, diagnostics. So we are in a moment where we can do a lot with uh, smartphones and here are just some examples uh, where the smartphones are connected with uh, this kind of devices. Uh, you can see here uh, this smartphone is connected with a lateral flow. Lateral flow is like a pregnancy test. Uh, I'll show you later some examples. Or a smartphone uh, transformed, converted to a microscope. Even the old models of phones were do, uh, used uh, even to do some electrochemical measurements and so on. Here is an example of uh, Google uh, Glass. Uh, uh, so this guy is uh, measuring uh, uh, lateral flow. So he is reading this and of course uh, uh, the uh, glass is uh, uh, communicating and uh, getting the results and properly sending to the medical doctor. So as I said, the sensors will be everywhere and they are going to be parameters of uh, uh, smart cities uh, in different parts of the, uh, these uh, future cities. Uh, and this is why uh, these uh, technologies or biosensing sensing technologies are really very, very interesting and important uh, for the future. So there are a lot of challenges. So uh, looking to all this uh, uh, overview uh, and in fact uh, it's difficult sometimes to address all these challenges like for example if we want to have these uh, devices completely non-invasive or sometimes for continuous monitoring uh, devices that uh, need sometimes to generate a lot of data, bio data or to have these devices disposable or to correlate this uh, with uh, some uh, uh, parameters related uh, to, to the body with interest or biomedical research uh, and in fact uh, we try to keep in mind one important thing uh, because if you want these devices to go in the market you need uh, to have uh, uh, three important uh, uh, points in mind uh, first of all uh, cost performance of the technology manufacturing capability and mass production capability otherwise uh, if you develop a biosensing device and uh, is not fulfilling these requisites uh, it's difficult to go in the market and uh, we, when we talk with speak with um, uh, uh, people that want to invest in industries, uh, they are looking to these aspects and if you don't fulfill this, uh, it's difficult that uh, your technology uh, uh, go to, uh, to go in, in the market. So these are really very important. And keeping this in mind, uh, we are trying to develop simple device, cost efficient devices, uh, based on different kind of nanomaterials for different kind of applications. I'm going to show you application in diagnostic, but also uh, environmental monitoring and uh, uh, safety and security and so on. Uh, before, I would like to acknowledge all my collaborators who has done the work. So from different countries, you see 11 nationalities working together with different expertise and different culture, but this is fantastic uh, for the research. Uh, some of them left uh, uh, the, the group and some joined again, so uh, there are also Italians. Uh, uh, Claudio is uh, from Padova University, he did also uh, uh, Laura here, then he did PhD at us and now he came uh, after the United States as a, a Marie Curie uh, postdoctoral research, so uh, happy to have also one from University of Padua. So uh, we have been working in this field since, since many, many years and uh, trying to see the advantages of uh, nanomaterials 
trying to get advantages of their electrical properties, optical properties, uh, but also we try not only to develop sensors to have very nice signal, very, very uh, amplified signal, but also in biosensors it's very important to deal with, micro with the sample. So it means that you need the device, but you need to consider how this will get in contact with liquids. So you need to have uh, a knowledge and then to develop microfluidics. Uh, this is why we are working with microfluidics, lateral uh, flow devices or lab on a chip. And also we work also with some devices called nanomotors. I'll show you why. And then linking the things together, as I said before, uh, terranostic nanosensor removal uh, platforms with interest for different uh, applications. So I'm going to give you just an overview, some examples uh, demonstrating how these nanomaterials can be used, applied in biosensors. And uh, starting from uh, uh, some examples related to nanoparticles, they're used as labels. I will move then to some uh, uh, microfluidics with lab on a chip, nanochannels uh, uh, that uh, are used to do some filtering, uh, preconcentration of the analyte, which is very important. And then uh, we say simple is the best, and this is true. And this is, I'm going to show you uh, paper-based sensors. Then some nanomotors uh, examples, and finally uh, nice materials, graphene, uh, and why we're using this in our biosensors. Uh, starting with nanoparticles. Uh, so this is a really very interesting field, and the people working in bio bioanalytical applications know that uh, there is a lot of need to have these kind of labels that can be connected to any kind of receptor and uh, used to detect them. So in a kind of indirect mode, and in fact we get advantages of uh, electrical properties of these uh, nanoparticles, for example, gold nanoparticles, cadmium sulfide, uh, uh, containing these uh, 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 metallic ions, uh, they can be detected by using electrochemical stripping, which is voltammetry. And in fact, we have been working with this to detect, for example, DNA uh, by using this electrochemical stripping, or even using these nanomaterials as alternatives uh, uh, to uh, dyes uh, uh, to do a kind of uh, uh, fluorescence microscopy, but in electrochemical mode. Uh, uh, even a study of uh, uh, interaction of drugs with uh, uh, cancer cells uh, uh, using these uh, uh, nanoparticles. But let me just uh, forget this and show you an example for a uh, cancer so you know there is a big issue uh, cancer is uh, a big is issue nowadays and uh, we are told by the, the medical doctor that uh, two are the most important scenarios for cancer. So the detection of uh, uh, fixed cancer cells or circulating tumor cells, the, the CTCs, uh, which are the cancer cells that escape from these uh, tumors and go to the bloodstream. So it's very, very important to, to follow up uh, these and uh, if possible to detect with at a very, very low level of concentrations because the numbers are really alarming. By 2030, as according to World Health Organization, uh, around 11 million of people probably are going to suffer cancer, but 30% of cases are uh, preventable and one third of cancer cases may be subject of treatment in case of an early detection. So what we do, this is a very simple schematic. You see here, this is a cancer cell. This is on top of an electrode. And we use some uh, gold nanoparticles modified with antibodies that interact with these uh, proteins on top of these uh, cancer cells. Also, we do some controls, so cancer cells that do not contain this protein. And we see that uh, if the gold nanoparticles are on top of this cancer cell and on top of this electrode, by using this uh, uh, electrocatalytic method, we called it, it is hydrogen evolution reaction induced by gold nanoparticles, we are able to measure the current produced by these gold nanoparticles, catalyzed by these gold nanoparticles, so we can distinguish between cancer cells and non-cancer cells. So this is a really very simple method that allows you also to do a quantification of these uh, uh, cancer cells. You can see here images of these cancer cells uh, uh, deposited on top of these electrodes. Uh. But this is not sufficient. As I said, this is just uh, for the fixed cancer cells. Uh, what we do is we detect also circulating tumor cells. And to achieve this, we connect this with some magnetic particles. So what we do is uh, 
uh, here you can see a cancer cells connected and these are magnetic particles that work in this way. So we have magnetic particles with antibodies that capture these cancer cells and then some other gold nanoparticles that interact here. And you see we are detecting these cancer cells through these uh, uh, gold nanoparticles. As I said before, we use these magnetic beads, uh, we interact these with uh, uh, electrodes that are containing some magnets uh, in a way that uh, we do the hydrogen revolution reaction now coupled uh, to this uh, uh, screen printed electrode and this uh, magnet underneath. In this way, we can uh, quantify the cancer cells, uh, and as you can see here by this curve, uh, we are able to detect uh, up to one cancer cells per 100 milliliter of uh, sample. But this is still not good, because uh, we should detect, uh, as uh, uh, told by medical doctor, one cancer cell per 5 milliliter of blood sample. And it is really very, very challenging, and nobody is able so far to detect this. Uh, so there is a lot of effort in the field of uh, early detection of cancer. So it's like in this big room, if I want to detect a small ball here, uh, and this is uh, filled with a lot of other things, so it's very difficult. My sensor probably is very, very sensitive, but uh, whatever I want, I want to detect is far away, so I need something to bring the analyte to the sensor. This is why we use uh, microfluidics, we use nanomotors and trying to enhance this detection. And following these strategies, we have been working with different other applications. For example, we could detect even bacteria. Uh, so this is a case of some uh, uh, E. coli using magnetic beads and using the same strategy. So this can work also for uh, food safety and security. So, and in fact, we are able to detect in this case because the levels were, were, were higher and we could detect, uh, 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 for example, E. coli in uh, water or in some uh, ground meat, uh, which is really very interesting for uh, safety and security. Also, uh, very interesting, uh, I don't know if you are uh, used with this uh, uh, famous PCR, so which is the amplification of uh, DNA analysis, which is uh, a, a technique that uh, also gave a, a Nobel Prize many years ago. So, uh, and usually it is based on fluorescence. Uh, what we did, and we patented this and reported for the first time, we integrated inside this PCR system the nanoparticles, magnetic beads, uh, so we end up with uh, this uh, very, very potential technique but with a very simple detection so we detect uh, we do a kind of PCR onto the electrode and we are able to detect by this for example uh, DNA related to Leishmania which is an infectious disease uh, uh, in this case it was for animals but also uh, this can be for any kind of uh, uh, application uh, so this is really very very interesting as I said to do uh, biosensing, to do some diagnostic, you need to de deal also with the sample. So we need to, to catch the analyte, we need to preconcentrate, filter, and this is why you use uh, nanochannels, Labona chip we call this. Uh, uh, we have in our laboratory uh, technologies to produce microfluidics, to produce uh, this kind of chips using uh, soft lithography or uh, thermoplastics. Uh, uh, so we can stamp these chips uh, uh, based on different materials, uh, different plastics. Uh, we can integrate uh, inside them and you see here just uh, some designs. Uh, so we control something happened here. No? Okay, it's okay. <laughs> so uh, we uh, uh, control this, uh, this structure and we can integrate inside these chips, uh, uh, these uh, electrodes. So what we do in a single electrode, we can do also in a microfluidic mode. And I'll show you uh, an example. Uh, but first, just to show that uh, we need to pr print electrodes uh, and for this uh, we use uh, either screen printing, uh, that probably is uh, known by you, or inkjet printing. It means that even a, a simple printer, office printer, can be used to print this kind of electrodes. And in fact, uh, using this uh, uh, inkjet printer, we are able to build uh, uh, even field effect transistors, so all printed, like in this room, for example, uh, by using different kind of uh, nanoparticle-based inks, uh, and we reported this uh, biofat uh, to do some uh, protein detection, so we could uh, build uh, uh, flexible uh, field effect transistors, uh, or even uh, transistors and uh, uh, onto paper, which are really very interesting as a cost-efficient uh, devices. 
Here is an example of uh, a microfluidic, simple microfluidics. Uh, uh, you can see here, this is a simple chip uh, with uh, uh, the inlet, outlet uh, of the liquid. The electrodes are here. We put some uh, magnet uh, because we are going to insert here some magnetic beads. Uh, uh, usually we use magnetic beads. Uh, these are modified with antibodies. Uh, then there are some immunoreactions. Uh, and of course, we have this uh, uh, red dot there, uh, the particle that we uh, uh, detect uh, through the electrochemical signal. Of course, we do some simulation of the magnetic field because we need to control this magnetic field because what happens is that uh, when you work with this uh, channel uh, by using these uh, uh, magnetic beads uh, modified uh, to connect afterwards some antibodies, uh, uh, we insert first the uh, magnetic bead with antibodies, then the sample with an analyte we want to detect, this is a protein, then another antibody, and afterward uh, the, mag uh, the particle that we we can detect and we get the signal. So you see here, we are running all the liquid and we are uh, pre-concentrating it uh, and getting the result. In fact, this was applied for some uh, neurodegenerative related disease. Uh, uh, so it was for APOE, which is uh, uh, with interest for Alzheimer disease. And of course, using this kind of device, there are a lot of opportunities. And in fact, uh, we, we have been working with microfluidics to detect also uh, some uh, electroactive compounds, doing also some separation inside the chip. Uh, uh, and you see here uh, the same kind of signals that you can get with a big uh, electrophoresis, capillary electrophoresis equipment, but all in a very small uh, equipment. And in fact, this comes from a, a project uh, uh, that uh, you have been collaborating in uh, United States, uh, it was for life in Mars. Uh, so the idea was to, to have these uh, very simple devices uh, to work uh, 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 for um, uh, explorations in uh, uh, other planets. Uh. So uh, these kind of devices have a lot of opportunities and in fact uh, we try to do this more complex. Uh, for example, this is a case where we use these devices to detect some contaminants but al also at the same time to destroy these contaminants. This is very interesting, uh, for example, in pharmaceutical industry where you need, for example, during the, the process of uh, drug production to control the, the quality of the liquids or some uh, toxins but also uh, not only to detect but also to destroy these compounds. Uh, for example, here you see some pesticides detection and then uh, during the same system, so in the microfluidics we see how we are destroying these pesticides and getting almost a pure solution. So we have systems, we call this smart system that can detect and destroy the contaminants. Uh, for example, uh, the same concept uh, was in this uh, chip uh, where we have been detecting some organic compounds and uh, by using uh, uh, some uh, uh uh, graphene oxide materials we are able to have in this chip uh, uh, detection and uh, uh, removal of contaminant uh, uh, by based on adsorption. So this is really very interesting and then you have uh, everything under control. So you, you not only detect the, the contaminant but also you take care of the environment not to release uh, uh, any other uh, uh, contaminant. Uh. Mm. Uh, the same, for example, for heavy metals. So this was uh, a chip uh, where we could detect uh, heavy metals uh, by using electrochemical stripping. And in the same chip uh, we are depositing, this is, you see, a flexible chip uh, where the electrodes are here and we are able to uh, detect these heavy metals but also uh, pre-concentrate this inside uh, this uh, chip. Another interesting material to, 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 to to uh, work uh, with complex samples are uh, channels. So we work also with these uh, 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 microfluidics in the channels. So these are some membranes used for filtering of liquids. And what we did is uh, we put these membranes uh, on top of these electrodes. So you can imagine that uh, uh, if I put a sample here, for example, this is a whole blood sample, uh, uh, based on the fact that there are some pores here, uh, these pores are uh, uh, make possible that uh, uh, small uh, analytes can go through the big parts, for example, the red and white cells stay on top. You can see here in the images uh, uh, still the, the pores available and the red blood cells and white blood cells on top. 
So by using some electroactive indicator, we are able to detect the different kind of compounds because we put inside the chip uh, uh, receptors, for example, DNA, antibodies, uh, and uh, uh, playing with this electroactive indicator and controlling the, uh, f the diffusion of this uh, uh, electroactive indicator, we can correlate this with uh, different kind of compounds. Uh, for example, uh, here also is uh, another uh, porous uh, material uh, used for the same, but you can see here the signal, uh, so the decrease of the electrical signal uh, during the increasing of the concentration of this uh, uh, analyte. This is a collaboration, in fact, with EMPA uh, in uh, Switzerland, where we work together for some uh, uh, protein detection. In fact, these uh, porous materials are very interesting and our partner in Barcelona, in the hospital, is working now and uh, trying to do some uh, real-time measurements of cancer biomarkers using these uh, porous materials uh, that can indicate, uh, just changing the receptor, uh, any kind of, uh, of uh, biomarker uh, related, for example, in this case is for a neuroblastoma kind of cancer uh, with interest uh, also for uh, drug development. Uh, and here are just uh, some results uh, we are getting and uh, uh, for this uh, uh, case. So, uh, simple is the best. Uh, why not to work with uh, very simple biodegradable materials? Uh, uh, for example, in the case of paper, you know, uh, uh, formed by cellulose, this is a low-cost material, abundant, easy to manufacture, uh, recyclable. Uh, the fact that the paper, the cellulose have a porous matrix, uh, uh, you can do uh, fluidics inside the paper, and the fact that there are some capillary forces, uh, you don't need to use energy, so this is a kind of zero energy device. Uh, interestingly, in the paper, we can also integrate nanomaterial, and as I show you, we can convert the paper into a plasmonic paper. So we can play with colors and we can do detection very simply, as we do, for example, when we detect pH, to do different kind of uh, 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 analysis. Uh, and in fact, as I said, why not to do detection as simply as we do when we measure the pH? So all the people working in chemistry have worked in the, uh, know the pH paper. So why not to play in a simple mode, just immersing the paper and then detecting through change of the color that can probably alert for, for, for something. And in fact, this is a very interesting technology working with paper. If you want, we wrote a nice review in the Chemical Society Review where you can learn about different paper-based technologies known as uh, dipstick, LFA, micropads. Uh, in fact, uh, we work with one of them, which is lateral flow and also some others, but uh, this is the most important, where uh, we work uh, in a similar mode as a pregnancy test uh, does. So, in a pregnancy test, in fact, uh, there are antibodies inside that uh, detect some uh, biomarkers, so uh, one can detect, uh, uh, see yes or no if it is pregnant, but also uh, nowadays uh, uh, one can see how many weeks. B it means that uh, it is related to the gonatropine uh, level, so uh, depending on the, the concentration, one can say if it is uh, two weeks, three weeks, and so on. So, this is a very quantitative uh, device. Uh, so we put some gold nanoparticles, antibodies inside these, and we have papers with different uh, porosity. And there is a video here explaining better than I do. So when the sample is inserted, the paper is serving as a, as a filter. So uh, big uh, things are filtering. Uh, so this is good. So the paper is doing the, the, the role as a filter. So, uh, inserting the, the sample or uh, a buffer depending on the application and you can see what happened. So, the sample is entered here and uh, the, the proteins you want to detect uh, are interacting now with these uh, antibodies connected to these gold nanoparticles. So these gold nanoparticles connected with antibodies are running now through the microfluidics and we interact with some other antibodies put on top of here at the detection and control line. So finally, uh, you can see the formation of these lines, detection line, control line, with different kind of color, different intensity.
So uh, getting at the end, uh, as you can see here, uh, different colors, as I said, and you correlate the intensity of these colors with the concentration of the analyte you want to detect. So it's really very simple. In a couple of minutes, you have the result and you can uh, get the information you want. So this is uh, how this device work. But uh, to do these devices more sensitive, if you want, and we are trying to make these devices work for cancer, you need to have these devices much more sensitive. And this is why we are working with different strategies, trying to do these devices more sensitive. For example, amplifying the signal of these by using some enzymes. Uh, uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, so putting these uh, enzymes on top, on top of these nanoparticles, and as you can see here, we get much more signal or uh, playing with uh, the architecture so we can imagine that if you change the shape of the paper you change the microfluidics and it means that you are changing the incubation time and in this way you can uh, play and change even the operation range and sensitivity and so on. So uh, there are a lot of op op uh, possibilities here. Uh, this is a case where instead of changing the geometry of this paper, we play with putting some wax pillars inside. This, these wax pillars are bothering the microfluidics, and in fact, we calculated that uh, we can tune the microfluidics according to the need, and then this can totally change the performance of the of the device. Uh, so this is really very interesting. Or we can do even detection of uh, uh, DNAs just changing the receptor. We can do this piece of paper able to detect even the DNA, as you can see here. Or uh, uh, detection of other biomarkers, uh, for example, here is uh, related to some cancer biomarkers that we are working uh, with uh, a hospital in Barcelona. An example that uh, is also very interesting is this uh, vertical flow. So you see here now the same concept, a piece of paper, but now integrated to a shearing. And why we did this? Because uh, we uh, learned that uh, in the case of prostate cancer, uh, for the analysis, you need to take at least 5 ml of urine and send this in the laboratory. What we did is uh, uh, we put in this urine uh, we put in this urine uh, these cartridges, so we put the paper here, so we take the sample, so the 5 ml of urine, but what happened is that at the same time we are pre-concentrating here. So we don't need now to send this 5 ml of urine in the laboratory, but we just look to the paper and see the gold nanoparticles here, and then by a camera we can get this image, and then of course this is much more amplified because uh, we are passing all the 5 ml of sample to this tiny piece of paper. So this is really very simple and very nice uh, uh, application with uh, a great uh, performance. Uh, or even detection of heavy metals, uh, uh, as alternative, for example, to ICPMS, uh, where we could detect uh, uh, heavy metals, for example, cadmium, to a level of uh, 0.1 ppb, uh, in alter as alternative to $100, uh, for example, for analysis you need for ICPMS uh, to, deck heavy, to detect heavy metals. Uh, and even recently we reported this piece of paper to detect uranium. Uh, this is a collaboration with the United States. Uh, uh, so you see this is an alternative to uh, uranium detection by using uh, radioactive uh, related instruments. Uh, uh, and instead of this we use this uh, uh, simple lateral flow and we did this with uh, a mobile phone and in fact these uh, devices were sent in the United States, uh, tested there and then we get very nice results uh, uh, for uranium detection. Of course we can uh, apply this for different other approaches, uh, uh, for example uh, detection of very very dirty samples because the paper is filtering here and then uh, we detect in this piece of paper. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, opportunities. I'm just uh, uh, passing this uh, even detection of uh, nanoparticles, uh, uh, gold nanoparticles, uh, quantum dots uh, and so on. Another interesting paper material is nanopaper. This is uh, produced by a, a special bacteria that is able to produce these uh, uh, tiny fibers uh, which are really very, very interesting because uh, this uh, material has a nice capability also to be modified with nanoparticles. So what we do here is uh, uh, the matrix of the nitrocellulose uh, nanopaper is modified now with uh, silver nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles or even uh, other converting, up converting nanoparticles uh, and 
and we have this uh, piece of paper now uh, with different colors. So you can see here uh, the paper without nanoparticles, the one with uh, uh, silver and gold nanoparticles. So what we can do with this paper, you can see that uh, of course, we do some uh, modification because we need to measure and uh, transform these to a, a, a micro well, uh, like uh, uh, ELISA, for example. But uh, uh, you can see that uh, in contact with different compounds, uh, this paper can change the color. You can see here the change of the color when this paper is in contact with different compounds. So we try now to make this paper specific to any kind of compound because what happens is that these nanoparticles are getting in, into reactions with these compounds and uh, changing their shape and in this way they are changing the plasmonic. So we have the change of the color that we measure and the correlate with uh, the concentration of the analyte we want to detect. For example, here we correlate this with uh, bacteria or some proteins that we want to detect. So we have this uh, a piece of paper able to detect uh, a different kind of uh, compounds. There are some images here demonstrating that this uh, system is working fine. I'm just uh, moving. And this is a nice example with uh, uh, smart packaging. So this paper, uh, uh, nano paper, which is modified with silver nanoparticles, we use this to detect uh, the food spoilage. So uh, we put this in contact, for example, with uh, fish or meat, and during the degradation process there are some uh, volatile compounds, usually based on aminic compounds, that c interact with uh, silver nanoparticles, changing, corroding these silver nanoparticles. And as you can see here, there are changes in the color, so, for example, control or fish or meat uh, spoiled. Uh, so we use this uh, and we offer this as a simple, smart material that can uh, show the quality of the food So for smart uh, uh, packaging, which is with interest for safety and security. Or even the detection of uh, uh, toxicity of water uh, by using some bacteria. There are some uh, well-known bac luminescent bacteria that uh, change the color in presence of some uh, contaminants, for example, pesticides. So what we did is uh, we integrated this uh, bacteria, which is really very stable, with a very nice uh, luminescence inside this paper, and we saw how the change of the luminescence of this bacteria was uh, happening in contact with different kinds of compounds, or toxic compounds. So in this way, we are able to detect these uh, uh, contaminants. So, still we have a lot of challenges, for example in the case of uh, very low concentrations, as I said, we need to take the single analyte to bring to the, the, the sensing surface. How we can do this? We work with nanomotors and this is a really very interesting project. We have been working since years in collaboration with uh, Professor Joseph Wang in the United States in a NATO project. So these are tiny devices that we produce by electroplating. So we electroplate this in using some molds. So these are some porous membranes uh, made of uh, uh, poly polymeric mem membranes uh, where we electroplate different kinds of materials. For example, we can uh, put here also platinum, we can put magnetic layers, we can put also uh, other kind of uh, other met metals. And after uh, dissolving the membrane, we get these nice cones that uh, uh, have very nice properties. So they have inside uh, platinum, they have inside magnetic layer, they have inside also some receptors we can put. When you put these uh, cones, you release this in medium of uh, hydrogen peroxide, oxygen is delivered and the bubbles of oxygen are serving as a propulsing force. So you can see here that these uh, uh, devices now can move. So we can change the, the orientation by applying magnetic field. Uh, but what we can do with this? In fact, we connect uh, receptors, for example, a receptor to, that re can recognize bacteria or some other receptors. And you can see here that uh, in the case of uh, uh, E. coli, we connected this with uh, receptors specific to E. coli. And you can see that uh, uh, this uh, uh, device uh, uh, can uh, capture E. coli inside drinking water, apple juice, or even uh, uh, seawater. 
Also, this is uh, specific. You can see here that uh, when you put this device uh, in presence even of other bacteria, for example, uh, Cerevisiae, this is specific only to these. So this is going to capture only E. coli, but not the Cerevisiae. So you see, still not capturing. Uh, so once uh, E. coli will be there, it will capture. You see here, it's capturing only E. coli. So this is also specific. The idea is to use these devices, as I said before, we release these in the, the matrix, in the, the sample, and then applying this magnetic field, we bring this to the surface of the sensor, and we are able to detect even uh, single uh, compounds. We use this, for example, to accelerate the diffusion, which is very important for microfluidics, uh, or, uh, and you can see here, the, the increase of the sensitivity when these uh, devices are uh, used. Uh, or even uh, to, to remove some contaminants, uh, these are still some motors uh, we used uh, uh, to remove some contaminants in water, uh, and so on. And finally, five minutes probably, uh, more. I will uh, show you uh, some examples related to graphene, which is a very interesting material uh, uh, that gave a Nobel Prize uh, six years ago to two guys in Manchester. Uh, we are involved in this uh, big European project uh, also with Manchester uh, since uh, years. So we work with this material, which is really very interesting because uh, uh, you can either produce this by CVD, but also you can exfoliate uh, using carbon and you can get these very nice sheets of uh, graphene. Uh, in fact, when you write with a pencil, what you leave in the, the, the paper is, are the flakes of this graphene. So very interesting, simple material. And in fact, uh, uh, there are nice uh, properties, uh, uh, mechanical properties, uh, strength, uh, but also very nice optical and electrical uh, uh, properties. Uh, this material also can be processed in solution, so we can have these flakes of graphene in solution, interestingly in water also. And you see here, uh, it is uh, also very stable, which is very interesting for biosensors. We can connect any kind of receptor to this, uh, uh, materials and as I said optical properties are really very interesting so uh, this material is photoluminescent over broad range of wavelength so and we use this uh, property to apply this in biosensors uh, so one interesting uh, property is the uh, catching of the fluorescence that is induced by graphene oxide graphene oxide uh, depending on the distance between the donor and the acceptor uh, the distance in the case of uh, uh, normal uh, quenchers used in bioanalytical application is around 10 nanometer. In case of graphene oxide, this uh, distance can be even higher, 30 nanometer. And we thought, what we can do with that? And it was really very interesting because uh, we saw that uh, uh, when we use graphene oxide in comparison to other forms of graphite, of carbon, like fibers, nanotubes, and graphite, the quenching, for example, that is induced by graphene oxide toward uh, uh, quantum dots, for example, cadmium selenide, uh, was really very, very interesting, very efficient. You can see here that uh, we have a total quenching from on to off uh, of uh, quantum dots uh, when you use graphene oxide, almost 90% in comparison to other forms of carbon. So based on that, we built a very simple device uh, to detect uh, uh, bacteria. And in fact, uh, uh, this is playing with these quenching properties of graphene oxide, uh, giving a very nice uh, response. We call this a digital-like response in comparison to uh, uh, analog-like response. But let me just show you that this concept we transferred also to a paper. And you can see here that uh, we could build and put all the compounds in the, the paper and transfer this. And you can see in this video. How we uh, converted this piece of paper based on graphene to a nice sensor. So we are cutting this piece of paper. We put on this uh, uh, quantum dot, these are cadmium selenide quantum dots. Uh, so 
So now you see that this uh, photoluminescence of uh, uh, quantum dots is uh, quenched uh, in the presence of uh, graphene oxide. Uh, so uh, this is really a very simple application but very efficient where uh, the graphene oxide is used uh, to reveal uh, this uh, uh, bacteria in this case but uh, we can adapt this for any kind of uh, application just by changing the receptor. So we correlate also here the change of the color, the photoluminescence with the concentration of the analyte we want to detect. And finally, I am just moving to the last thing I wanted to show you, which is the stamping of graphene. A dream. A dream. So we can also stamp this graphene onto any kind of surface. Not matter if it seems impossible. Why not invest in ingenuity, talent, and technology to achieve intelligent, versatile, cost efficient, and robust solutions? Why not print our future? This way, we can face all the challenges that appear day after day with new scenarios in such varying environments as transportation. Logistics, home, office, or the internet. Graphenica Lab has succeeded in starting from the basis of graphene, the finest, lightest, and strongest known material. The best heat and electricity conductor, almost transparent, flexible, and elastic, an abundant element in nature, sustainable, and offering almost unlimited fields of application. Starting from a graphite exfoliation process, we can transfer the properties of graphene to any material, making it intelligent and enabling it to become a sensor for any physical, chemical or biological task. Even for heating, we do this through a proprietary technology, wax printing membranes, accepting a wide variety of water-based inks at a highly efficient cost and which can be mixed with biological material opening a door of infinite possibilities in terms of biosensors manufacturing. This system means a world of unlimited creative possibilities. No matter the shape or the size or the final use, wax printing is possible on almost any type of surface, both flexible and rigid, curved or sharp, performed in-house or in-field, and the results are spectacular. Chemical sensors, physical sensors, biosensors, tactile services or not, supercapacitors, energy harvesters, NFC tags, and more importantly, a practically unlimited range of applications in internet-related fields, including smart transportation, smart home, smart office, smart grid, or smart packaging, as well as wearable devices for diagnostics. Because with Graphenica Lab, we have the technology today that will be indispensable tomorrow. So I would like to, to finish now my talk with uh, the last uh, uh, conclusion uh, uh, about uh, what I tried to, to, to say to you, uh, that uh, uh, trying to convince you that uh, these nanomaterials are really very interesting so that these can be coupled with uh, different kind of materials, uh, simple uh, materials, uh, uh, paper, plastic, uh, uh, building devices with interest for different kind of uh, diagnostics. Uh, so we wrote also different uh, reviews. If you want, uh, you just write me an email if you have not access to this, uh, 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 where you can see uh, different kind of applications. So again, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now it's uh, <coughs> time, of course, for any question for the audience. There is one question. Yes. About the, the nanomotors. Yes. How they can, not, I, I did not well understood how the nanomotor can move. Yeah, uh, these are, uh, uh, they have the form of uh, a small cone which is empty inside, uh, so uh, they contain uh, uh, 
platinum, which is a catalyst uh, which interacts with hydrogen peroxide in liquid. So with hydrogen peroxide there is uh, oxygen produced. So these oxygen bubbles are going out and serving as propulsing force. Uh, so this, uh, in this case hydrogen peroxide is a kind of fuel for, the, for this motor. And uh, uh, oxygen bubbles are the one that giving the propulsing force. So once the oxygen goes out, the motor goes from the other side. So it's continuously going Exactly, and they have exactly, and they have a magnetic layer. So when we apply magnetic field, they can ch change the orientation. So we are playing with them like with cars, trying to find new fuels, doing this more efficient, and even playing with photocatalytic currents, so we can uh, uh, fuel them uh, through the light. So there are a lot of opportunities. Yeah. So regarding uh, the three devices, are those uh, uh, imprinted? And second question is, is that really wait, graphene? Wait, 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 so wait, 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 uh, So regarding the graphene devices, um, are, are those ink printed? As far as I understand, right? Uh, these devices uh, we produce uh, through inkjet printing. Uh, but also through uh, stamping. So uh, we have a patented technology where we can stamp uh, this uh, to any kind of surface by using some membranes uh, that uh, we use, uh, uh, doing some filtering process, and then stamping this uh, onto any kind of surface, different technologies, yeah. So it's a process that it's really able to print graphene or few layer graphene yeah this is a very good question graphene. yeah exactly yeah this is we are trying to to control this and to see really that we are working with graphene because we want to see if the graphene and when i say graphene i mean a few layers of graphene not uh, a lot of layers or not graphite so uh, and so we are the sheet resistance for example I, I cannot say you exactly what the sheet, uh, resistance in this case will depend on the kind of uh, uh, material and the grade of oxidation. We are very much interested to have a, a very a very low resistance or high conductive because the kind of applications we are working in this case uh, need uh, uh, to have a very good uh, uh, conductivity. Uh, but the idea is to achieve, for example, the same as we have, for example, with ITO, you know, and uh, or for example, the same as we can have with PDOT, which is a, conduct as a polymer, conductive polymer. So, uh, uh, and we are still uh, trying to, to distinguish and see if really, uh, and trying to work with the cases where we really have only graphene and see the advantages, yeah. I think it could be interesting as we live in a department of information engineering to know something more about the interface between these materials and sensors in the world of communication and data integration. So could yeah. you comment about this uh, evolution that we expect uh, to see these devices uh, <coughs> integrating in IoT or whatever yeah. we're going to see in the next future? Yeah, uh, these devices uh, uh, generate data. So this is uh, very important, so the connection of these devices with uh, IT uh, platforms and in fact uh, nowadays there is a tendency to work with uh, uh, devices that uh, uh, the data are uh, uh, calculated and then uh, uh, for example uh, the same you use for example, you know, I don't know if you use this uh, uh, Shazam uh, program to, to, for, to capture the music. So the same kind of algorithm, for example, is used by uh, nanopore technology, which is an uh, Oxford company uh, working with uh, DNA. What they are doing is uh, they are trying to do sequencing of DNA, so trying to pass the DNA sequences through pores. And you know these uh, DNA sequences have a lot of bases and a lot of signals can, can be generated. What they do is uh, they are having all these signals in the database, so they have all registered, so there is a big uh, data capacity there. And when they pass through this nanopores, uh, an unknown sample, they try to compare now as the Shazam does. <laughs> so the signal coming from an unknown sample with this big data and trying to see the matching between what you get now here from this database. So, and in fact, this company is doing, what he's doing is uh, uh, giving almost for free the, the, the device, but uh, uh, a 
obliging the people to pay the fees to use these data. So you guys working in, uh, in IT and all these uh, uh, have a great opportunity to couple with biosensors because uh, the future technologies for biosensors need a lot of data generation because we have a lot of problems with uh, what I show here was really very nice, uh, but it's not that nice because uh, Sometimes we have a lot of problems with interferences and uh, you need to deal with interferences, uh, noises and so on. So this means data. So if you are able to, to, to control this data and to compare these with databases, then you are the one that can give the best results. So we are very much looking for corporations. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Question. Uh, Wait, 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 wait until we catch. Yeah, these devices, in principle, are going to be very, very cheap. So we are talking about devices that are less than one uh, euro. So uh, very cheap. So in fact, uh, is a collaborator of us uh, in the United States. Uh, I don't know if you have heard the uh, Professor Whitesides group. Uh, they also created a company. We also have an, uh, our company. And their company is called Diagnostic for All. It means that this kind of diagnostics should be available for everybody. But then we enter in, in some other issues where the cost and uh, these things are not probably make very happy the companies. Uh, but the idea is to have these very, very cheap devices because this should be like a right for everybody. So to have uh, the right to have your, your diagnostic, your uh, quality of the air, quality of the water. Uh, and so this should be very cheap. Yeah. In one of your very early slides, you mentioned uh, characterization and metrology. Could you tell me something about that? Yeah, uh, this is a key point uh, if you want uh, uh, for uh, to increase the, the technology readiness level of your devices. You know, uh, TRLs are very important for uh, the, the robustness of the devices, and the robustness of the devices is very much dependent on the metrology. So when I say metrology, it means that the, all the, the parameters of the starting materials, so if all these materials, the, the, the parameters are not under control, you are not going to get a stable uh, material. So if you analyze carefully a material, a device, uh, you have probably th thousands of parameters you need to keep under control. Uh, so uh, these are either chemical parameters uh, related to composition, uh, uh, the quality and so on, physical parameters uh, in addition to dimension and so on. So all these uh, metrology aspects are very, very important. And uh, if you go and try to send this device to the, the market, uh, this is uh, uh, these parameters are crucial, otherwise uh, uh, the, the, the device has no chance to go out. Yeah. Okay. At this point, I think that uh, if there is no other question from the audience, we can thank again Mr. Kossi for talk opening new windows to our news and collaboration with the field of sensors and biosensor and we hope to see you again very soon in public. Thank you. Thank you very much.